Welcome to the KBB View podcast, and for those keeping meticulous records, this is episode 6 of season 13. I'm Andy Davis as always, and we're getting all nostalgic in this one as we mark 40 years of KBB Review. Yes, we were first published in 1984, a year made famous by blokes called George, namely Orwell, Michael and Boy. So who better to mark the occasion than our very own George, George Dean, and he's been having a chat with a couple of top retailers, and they've both been in the game for more than 40 years, and we're getting a view on what the industry was like back then, and how it compares to now. So we have friends of the show, Tina Riley from Modern Homes in Leamington Spa, and Phil Beechinor from Alexander in Worthing. And as an added bonus, we've also got Mark Pearson in there. Now he's KBB Reviews Operation and Events Director, in other words, the man behind the KBB Review Retail and Design awards but before he joined us he was a very accomplished bathroom retailer specifically with porcelanosa and he started his career over 40 years ago too so if you're fans of how it used to be back in the day you don't want to miss this one and speaking of the KBB Review Retail and Design Awards, entries are currently open for the 2025 event. Yes, if you're a kitchen or bathroom retailer, designer, supplier or installer, we have categories for you. It's the biggest awards in the sector and it's completely free to enter. Not only that, but if you get shortlisted, you get two tickets to the event for free as well, so you really do have nothing to lose. The closing date is November the 14th. That's November the 14th. There will be no extensions to that. You can find out everything you need to know at kbbreview.com com forward slash awards and that link is in the episode description so now here is our very own george dean so i'm joined by mark pearson events and operations director here at taylor's media the company behind kbb review and the kbb review podcast but mark's also a former retailer at mitchell's tiles and bathrooms and porcelanosa good afternoon mark good afternoon george <laughs> happy to be here with me today of course yes and also with us today, we have Tina Riley, Managing Director at Modern Homes in Warwickshire. How are you doing, Tina? We're all right. Thank you very much. Nice to see you. Good to hear. And finally, we have Phil Beechnor, Managing Director of Alexander in Worthing. How are you doing, Phil? Not very well, thank you. Brilliant. So thank you all for joining me today to discuss the past 40 years of kitchen and bathroom retail. That's quite a scary number, I imagine. So Tina, let's start off with you. How did you come into the industry? And what was your first role? Truthfully, my first role when I was about eight was to earn my pocket money on a Saturday morning by cleaning the showroom for my father, which looking back on it, I believe was probably enforced child labour. But there we go. I then went to work for him in 1978 for about uh, six weeks to cover for somebody who was off having an operation. Fast forward 47 years and I'm still here. One of these days, I will wake my mind up what I would like to do as a career and pop off and do it. But I don't know when that's actually going to happen. So you're kind of the definition of starting from the bottom and then working your way up. Indeed. I could never reach the top of the tall wall cabinet, but I was all right cleaning bake units. Oh, fantastic. And Phil, what about you? What was your first role in the industry? And when was that? Uh, back in 1984, I started working for a kitchen manufacturer down in the south coast, Paul Rosa. started working off in the factory and then progressed from there. Wow, yeah. So again, another really long ranging career in the industry. Yes, yeah, it's been a, been a while. And Mark, what about you? First role in the KBB sector, or the bathroom sector as it was then, I was a showroom manager up in my home city of Sheffield for Mitchell's Towns and Bathrooms. At that time, we were a big reseller of porcelainosa products tiles particularly then we were a big customer of porcelain houses probably one of the biggest in the uk at that time so this is going back to the early 80s i then went on to work for porcelain osa managing various showrooms a national showroom manager and then finally director of their group operation and obviously i know what you do now but just for listeners what's your current day job right my current day job is i'm the events and operations director well for taylor's media but uh, principally the kbb review industry awards entries are now open i was going to say make sure you get that one in there (laughs) Do you remember back then, Mark, what your first impressions of the KBB industry were 40 years ago? I can't remember 40 years ago, but I think reflecting on that, I think my perspective then would have probably been quite insular. You're heavily influenced by the reps that you got to know who came through your front door, you became mates with, and because you liked them, you liked the products, that kind of thing. 
Yeah, I think your world was largely driven by that and also your showroom environment, the, the, the amount of product that you were able to display. Would you agree with that, Tina? Do you think that's a fair assessment? Yes, definitely. And in fact, I joined at quite an interesting time because when I first started, we were selling really well-known British brands at the time, like Elizabeth Ann and English Rose and, and people like that, who then unfortunately all went out of business And we were one of the first showrooms that actually took a German range on. We took Beckerman on, and at the time, a Spanish range called Show. So that was really quite interesting because that was the first time that proper fitted kitchens as such and lots of different designs and lots of different things. There was a huge disparity between the way the German companies worked and the Spanish company. If the German company said that their delivery would be three o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, trust me, at three o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, that delivery would arrive. The Spanish stuff, which was beautiful, you'd kind of get it manana. And Miguel would drive from Spain wearing his slippers and drinking quite a lot of San Miguel. And he could turn up at any time. So it was quite an interesting experience when I first started, the difference between dealing with the British manufacturers and then dealing with the continental manufacturers. Right, I see. Okay, that's really interesting because people will kind of argue that those German brands in some ways dominate the market today, don't they? So if they were a fresh entity back then, that's really interesting and kind of a different perspective than where we yeah, are right yeah. now. Yeah, no, they were very, very new then. And, and the way that they did things was very, very different to how we had been used to dealing with the British manufacturers at the time. To be fair, we've gone full circle. We're now back with British manufacturing wherever possible. So we've kind of gone the whole route over our 57 years or whatever it happens to be that we've been in business. Yeah, very interesting. What would you say, Phil? What were your impressions when you first started out? And how did the industry seem to you? Well, at the time, I I started off on the tools. So for the first 10, 15 years, I was more on the sort of installation side. And I was working for a quite reputable uh, manufacturer and more prestigious houses around Sussex and Surrey. And we were quite proud to work for that company and it was well publicised that it was in the mid to higher end. And then Paul de Rosa got bought out by Electrolux at the time and then they went more onto the contract side. So I decided to shut my own installation company, which led into getting into retail, which led to where I am today. So I, the first 15 years of my career were more looking as a installer slash uh, installation company than actually a retailer. Yeah, okay. So Tina, you touched briefly there on how brands have changed, but what about products, would you say? Have they changed massively or not too much? No, not massively. I mean, fundamentally... To be fair, kitchen units, the quality of the cabinets, hinges, door boxes, etc., have improved. But a kitchen unit is essentially a box with a door on it. And I have been told many times in the past not to sneer at a 20-year-old rep who comes in and tells me, this is a brand new style, a brand new range. You've never seen anything like it before. And I go, oh, well, Burbage did exactly that door in 1982 or whatever. I think the biggest change has been appliances. Gone are the days of a double oven with a gas hob and possibly an undercounter integrated larder fridge if you were very posh. Which I suppose at the time must have been revolutionary, wouldn't uh, yeah. it? Yeah. And now, in my opinion... Have they gone a little bit too far with all the connectivity and you can, for some obscure reason, load your washing machine, do everything you need to do. Then you go to work and you press an app on your phone to switch the washing machine on. Sorry, I'd probably forget to do it. But yeah, I think appliances have changed more than anything else. And fundamentally, I think what's changed for us as a business is that we are now involved in more of the whole project so whereas it just used to be the kitchen units now we do flooring we do lighting we do heating we do the decorating we even have a company locally where we organize blinds we've got glazing company we deal with so if a customer wants a window changing we can do that we've got a building company we work with so if they want structural work we can do that So I think for us, the biggest change that we've done over the last quite a few years, to be honest, is to try and be a one-stop shop for a customer so that they will have all of those products. They might as well buy them from me rather than go to 10 different places after we finish the contract. So fundamentally, I think that's the biggest change that I've seen. Oh, okay. Sounds nice and simple for the customer as well, doesn't it? When they get all their products from one place. Yeah, definitely. So Mark, was there very much in terms of product diversity back in the day? Because now people sort of say that maybe we have too much choice on the market. 
So obviously we live in KBB world, but if you were a consumer walking in to get maybe your first kitchen, there might be too much on the market. Do you think it's fair to say it was easier back then? I think consumers then were quite happy to spend their Saturday and Sunday, because, you know, we opened Sundays then too, pounding the pavements, visiting yeah. various showrooms rather than sitting behind a screen in their, in their living rooms. I think that it was easier for the retailer because, generally speaking, the consumers were probably less well-educated when they arrived in your showroom then because they'd not done all their internet research. Their choices then were probably governed by what they'd had time to look at before they came to you. What do you think, Phil? Were things sort of simpler when there was less on the market? Or do you think it's a good thing now there's more choice? 30, 40 years ago, a lot of stuff was stopped, wasn't it? And there was less choice because the doors were all stacked in a factory somewhere, where now everything seems to be more made to order. You seem to find that um, new products, I mean, stone is a, is a massive, plus it used to be the rich and famous of how Corian and granite, but now every kitchen has, has quartz or sun man made products. So I think the variety is much more because it's all made pretty much to order. So they're not just stacking factories of cathedral style doors or, you know, there's obviously been trends if you go back to, 30, 40 years ago, if I think back, I mean, there was really four or five styles of doors that were the popular one, whereas now there's symptoms because they've got so much products available that they can just manufacture them to your needs. It's massively different in that respect. Yeah, so products have sort of changed a lot. But would you say, Tina, about customers? I know obviously people are always going to need new kitchens and bathrooms. But do you think they're still shopping in the same way they were 40 years ago? It depends on the age group of your clientele. So we generally attract an older profile of customer. We're very lucky, again, being local family business, long established. I would say potentially 90% of the work that we do is for people we've already worked for before. So that's fairly easy. The issue sometimes therein lies nowadays with obviously social media. So a, a, a younger profile of customer will come in with her Pinterest page or her Instagram pictures that she likes the look of. It's then the reality of actually, mm, well, maybe what you're looking at is a 70, 80, 90,000 pound kitchen. Your budget is uh, 15. How are we going to achieve that? Also, my older clientele will use my experience, which comes from a good place. And if somebody said to me, I wouldn't have that again, or if my fitter said that was difficult to fit or something's proved difficult to maintain, we would always advise that client not to have that again. The older profile of customer will take my advice because they know it's coming from a good place. Younger profile of customer will argue the toss with you because they know better because they've read it on the internet. So I obviously don't know very much about the world before social media. So were people walking in, you were having to educate them on everything from like the kitchen sink to the cabinet doors or? Oh, completely. Years ago, completely. And actually, you've still got to often re-educate the younger profile of, of customer because it's more difficult than somebody coming in with zero knowledge. Um, so every day is a learning day, basically. Yeah. Yes, I do occasionally find it sometimes more difficult now than potentially maybe it was 30 odd years ago. So Mark, as someone very closely involved in the production of our annual awards, you've had a really unique perspective, I think, in how the industry's changed over the last 40 years. So what are some of the best changes you'd say that you've seen? Well, I think as a, a young showroom manager then, I remember having all the quotes to get out, which you, you know, we produced largely manually in the beginning, and all the drawings, of course, of the fabulous bathrooms that we were going to install and sell the dreams on so i remember sort of burning the midnight oil with my scale ruler and pencil and doing elevation and plan drawings of the wonderful bathrooms we were going to build so i think i think one of the standout changes that i think i said is the advent of cad you know you really can sell the dream now to the end user photorealistic renders of of what they're going to they're going to step into more than that now you've got the virtual reality side haven't you Absolutely. where people can actually stand in and in their environment and they've got a 360 degree view so i think that's fascinating and i'd have loved to be involved in that at that time yeah, absolutely. It sounds like it's had a huge change. I know 40 years is a long time and it would be concerning if it hadn't changed, but it sounds like quite a huge lot has. So Phil, what do you think about customers' expectations when they come in? Have they changed massively from when you started or not so much? Yes and no. I think they're all, ultimately they've always wanted a good service, a reliable service and good quality product. 
jobs. People lead busy lives and they, you know, the reason they come to someone like ourselves is they just want a one-stop shop that will follow it through. So I don't think expectations have necessarily changed. I think that the way that we do business has, has changed. It used to be everything was done on a Saturday in the showroom. People used to come in on a Saturday. It was always very, very busy at the weekends. People would come in and then you'd go through all the detail. A big change is you'd arrange to meet up the next, the following Saturday and go through the changes, possibly do them there and then, and you'll get hopefully the order then. But where things have changed is they can just email you at a drop of a hat. They can ask you questions mid afternoon. They think, oh, I'll just, you know, I'll just email Phil and ask him that. So I think it's not necessarily the expectations have changed, but I do think that the way that we do business and that the Europe on call like 24-7 sitting in your office waiting for someone to contact us rather than, although we do do a lot of business in the show, and certainly all the presentations are, once that's been done, everything is like digital, you know, emailing, planning, or designs, uh, answering questions, um, whereas all we used to be done in like one or two hits. Now it's done over a long period of time. Oh, so retailers kind of have to be on all the time 24-7. Instead of nine to five. Yeah, I mean, if you're sad enough like me that looks at your emails in the evenings, you'll see that, you know, oh, Phil, did that include undercover lighting? Oh, Phil, can you send me some samples for some glass? Or Phil, can you do this? Whereas, and I think remote working, that, I mean, obviously that, a lot of that's recent, born out of COVID, but people can actually come in during the week a little bit more. So, Saturdays, which was your big order day, and you used to tailor everything for the end of the month and have your big flows going on. It's not done like that anymore. But getting back to your original question, their expectations, I don't think really has changed dramatically. They've always wanted a good service and a good product. Tina hit it on the head. Some of the youngsters, I mean, they do have champagne ideas and beer money. They see stuff and they say, oh, I want this, and they just really don't have the understanding of the budget. So, Tina, we've established that there's lots that's different over the past 40 years, which does make a lot of sense. But in your mind, what are some of the best ways that the industry has changed in that time? Certainly from my point of view, the amount of females within the industry now. When I go back to when I first started, Diane Berry is is one of the few that has been around for the same amount of time. Maybe Rennie Mascara, one or two others. But I I can remember going on a a net jolly to celebrate their 21st year in business in the UK to Germany and out of 52 dealers I was the only female. What year would that have been do you think? Yeah long time ago probably I would say about 30 years ago but definitely over the last few years I would say the last 10 years and certainly maybe a little bit more than that the amount of women within the industry whether it's owning their own business whether it's designers whether it's working for manufacturers whether it's whatever is much 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 higher now and I think that is absolutely fantastic and brilliant and a huge positive as a female working in the industry and long may we continue to encourage it. Yeah, there's a lot more chat now about sort of different kinds of people working in the industry that wouldn't necessarily have been there 40 years ago. So yeah, that's pretty good. I think the problem that we've generally got within the industry as a whole is we've never been taken seriously as an industry. So there is never a career choice of, oh, you can go to college and learn how to be a good kitchen designer. Every single person generally that I've come across in all my years of doing this have got into the business by accident. Now, there is nothing wrong with that. And the people working in the industry, there are some fantastic people. But why do we not have qualifications? Why do we not have a proper career path? And whether it's from the point of view of working for a showroom, whether it's installers, whatever it is, everybody generally gets into this pretty much by accident. And it's a huge industry. Why is this still the case? suppose it's quite nice, though, that if everyone stumbles in here by accident, then the turnover rate is actually quite small. Oh, it's very low because everybody just changes career. I mean, the, the guys will agree with me. You can you get a decent rep and you can probably see him for 20 years because he might, he might have swapped companies. But once they are in the industry, people rarely get out. It kind of seems to suck you in. But I, I just think we should still put more emphasis on it being 
a proper career. Yeah, definitely. We definitely need to have maybe some more career pathways in there. Phil, what do you think? What would you say are some of the highlights of the last 40 years for you? Back in the day, you used to get a lot more jollies and trips. I know that's so obviously they were funded by a lot of the appliance manufacturers and uh, well, the manufacturers in general. And what was quite good back in those days, you used to go far and wide across the world, meet like minded business owners, and you used to have a good like networking environment. Now, when you do obviously get the odd trip, but it's a lot of it is training related, and I know the, the you know the reasons behind that. But the highlights, some of the places I've travelled in the world through selling appliances, is it, it's phenomenal. And so that's a sort of a personal benefit. But I think just the success of staying in business, growing it, seeing some of the projects that you've done get recognised by our clients, and just seeing it from concept to completion, get thanks for the lovely job that the so and so has done. But I suppose the highlight has got to be the KBB Installation Company of the Year, 2022. I must get that one in, must not I? And as far as actually thinking about it, between the three of you, I wouldn't even want to hazard a guess as to how many projects you guys have actually completed. If you were to add those numbers together, that must be thousands, I think, wouldn't it? That must give you a real sense of satisfaction looking back. Oh, definitely. You still get the buzz. If you win a nice site or you go up against somebody else, you still get a buzz when you know someone walks in with a nice deposit check. It's a lovely industry street to be in and it's every day is different i mean i know managing director everyone brings rubbish to your door some days but the actual rewards are are, it's a nice industry to be involved in that's for sure so tina you touched on this ever so briefly but on the flip side of what i just asked what do you think maybe was a little bit better back in the day 40 years ago what is there that we're doing now that maybe we got right back in the past and maybe we've kind of strayed from the path a little bit i think we slightly touched on it earlier i think the expectation levels of the contactability of you now from the client's point of view because of WhatsApp messages, emails, whatever, whatever, whatever. In years gone by, you shut the showroom at five o'clock or whatever, you went home, you could switch off from work, you didn't have to think about it, customers couldn't contact you. Yeah, you might get an answer phone message in the morning or you'd wait for the post to arrive to see if there was any letters in the post. Customers expect responses immediately now. I think also, obviously, as the guys are probably the same as we are. We have an initial consultation in the, sh- in the showroom. We then do the measure up in somebody's house. We then produce the plans and quotes. They're kind of getting used to going to somewhere like Wren where the plan is done for them, with them, in that showroom in 20 minutes. Well, that's not how we have ever worked. And I would always rather do a plan A, a plan B, and all this is an option of a plan C or whatever. That all takes time. However much you say to a customer, this will be 10 days or two weeks before this is ready for you to come and look at or we send to you or whatever, you can guarantee within three days They're then emailing to say, is my quote ready? Have you done it yet? What's going on? And I think it's the fact that everything that we do nowadays, you know, you press a button on your phone and your Amazon delivery arrives the next morning. We don't work at that speed in this industry. Oh, you're only human. Um, You can't produce stuff that quickly, can you? No, well, no, and absolutely. But that, everything needs time and effort. Again, you know, does anybody ever just wake up in the morning and go, well, today's the day I'm going to buy a new kitchen? It is usually something like an appliance breaking down or whatever that leads on to that project. So, yeah, I think just the fact that customers are expecting you to be reading emails at 10 o'clock at night and responding to them sometimes makes you feel like, oh, I never get away from the business now. I've got a week off next week. I know I will end up answering WhatsApp messages to the fitters, answering emails and potentially taking phone calls or when I'm on holiday. Whereas in years gone by, we shut the showroom for a fortnight and nobody seemed to worry about that. It's what we did. And now we kind of have to be available 24-7, seven days a week. Sounds like everyone switched on all the time without a break, basically. Yeah. And I think that can occasionally be an issue because I get it when it's your own business. It's in the back of your mind anyway. And you may be thinking, oh, dear God, did I do that today? Have I done that? Oh, I must get on with that in the morning. But when you've got added pressures of lots of emails, 
And I get clients often would email of an evening because they're sitting down watching Coronation Street and it occurs to them, oh, I've forgotten to ask this question. I think it's the fact that they expect a response. Yeah, that's a bit unreasonable round the clock, isn't it? What do you think about that, Phil? Is there anything that you think maybe when we started out, we did better as an industry that we maybe have lost track of? Not necessarily better, easier. I mean, it goes back to this thing spoken a lot about recently. Good installers, as years have gone on, it's harder and harder to find good plumbers, electricians. Uh, Aging with me, I guess. I mean, the average fitter on our firm is going to be in their late 40s, 50s, I guess. I mean, we've brought young people on, they stay with you, they move on, they might move out of industry or they decide to go self-employed. It doesn't seem to be a, a job for life anymore. And I've got three kids and one of them really aspire to want to be a kitchen fitter. They don't want to be into marketing or influencing or law or into recruitment. So it's not actually, from the youngster's point of view, necessarily an attractive industry for them. So I think... Although the design side, I think we don't seem to have so much problems. And that's the biggest difference. Whereas I could advertise for kitchen fits there and I'd have views. Whereas now, I really have to go hunting. So back in the day, there was a lot more labour readily available, basically. Yeah, definitely. And people were training. Youngsters were going to college. We used to work with, with a local college and they used to offer us electricians and planners and carpenters on, on, on apprenticeship schemes. And we used to have two or three at any one time, always on the go. Now, they've taken, uh, they've actually shut the course in work. In Northbrook College, don't have an electrician course at the moment because there wasn't enough people to take it up. I mean, one of my guys that works for me, his son, he's got to travel 20 miles over to Brighton to do an electrical course because there wasn't one worthy. And so that was a lot easier to get good labour. Now, we have got good labour, but it's much, much harder to find. I absolutely can't not not ask you guys. Uh, who do you think is your most memorable client? If you had to cast your mind back through all the years, what about you, Tina? Do you have any particularly memorable clients? Not even necessarily celebrities, just any stuck in your mind. Oh, well, I was going to say we don't we don't have a lot of celebrities in Leamington Spa. Oh, no, yeah, I mean it's just the the occasional funny stories, isn't it? I mean, I got dragged to site not that long ago by a client who reckoned that his bathroom, we designed it badly. It was, um, I mean, to be fair, he was an ex-conservative MEP. Not famous, but, you know, it was absolutely atrocious and blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, what have we done? As far as I know, it's all been done, finished. And I went and he had a run of fitted furniture with a bidet in it. The room was quite tall. And as he walked forwards towards the fitted furniture and sat down on the bidet, his knees were knocking onto the furniture, at which point he said, I designed the bathroom incorrectly. I pointed out my understanding was that you used a bidet in the same position that you used a toilet and you backed onto it with your knees floating in the room, of which there was plenty. No, apparently it was completely wrong. An hour and a half later, his wife rings to apologise by which stage I had done a straw poll of all of my fitters and various different other people to say, which way would you use a bidet? And they all told me, sitting on it with your knees into the room. Um, he did then have the good grace to apologise. But yeah, I mean, there's funny stories every day, isn't there? We've had police turn up on site because the neighbour reported we were stealing things when we were removing the old kitchen from the um, property. I suppose um, out of context, that might not look too good, I suppose. Uh, yeah, it didn't Odd look ideal. Steal, though, isn't you it? Know, we helps? laughed about it. Yeah, I mean, well, we can take the old kitchen. So, yeah, I, I, I don't, most of my clients are fairly memorable for one way or another. What about you, Phil? Do you have any particularly memorable clients you want to spill the beans on? We have done some sort of B-list celebrities, but no one really to write home about. And unfortunately, the most memorable ones are the ones that have given you the most amount of grief, unfortunately. And like Tina says, most of them are sort of unfounded and they come up with something, but they just have well, got too much time on their hands and they're, and they're quite demanding. But... We've been to some nice places. I mean, we've, we've fitted in Jersey. We've fitted down in South of France. We did one over in the Netherlands. We've done a couple down in Germany. So back in the, the old days, there used to be a big difference because if they could claim back the VAT. But... So a nice note just to finish up with my last question is, uh, I'll start with you, Phil. If you could go back in time those 40 or so years, what advice would you give to yourself if you were just starting out now? 
what sort of sage wisdom have you got that you can share? Oh, I don't know. I don't think I would change it, actually. It's been a, been a journey, but it's been a good journey for me. I don't think I would. I would like to have got on that IT bandwagon crystal ball, that's for sure. But uh, now I, 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 I enjoy this industry, so I'm going on with that. What do you think, Tina? What would you go back and say to yourself if you could? Again, I, I don't think I would. I've always said, although truthfully, there are days when I'm here and it's all going a little bit pear-shaped, where you think, oh, why am I doing this? But I have never woken up in the morning and thought, I do not want to go to work. 47 years is a long time to do something. It's a combination, I believe, of each day is very different, each customer is different, each challenge is different. But it doesn't feel like 47 years. I still wake up in the morning and I'm quite happy to come into the showroom and deal with what the day needs to be. So, no, I don't think I would change anything, really. Oh, that's nice to hear. And finally, Mark, just to finish up, what about you? What advice would you go back and give yourself? Oh, well, looking back, um, I'd probably spend more money on advertising and put more entries into the KBB Review (laughs) Industry Awards. (laughs) Yeah, entries opened on the 1st of September. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's a really, really nice note to end things on there. So thank you all for your time today, Tina, Phil and Mark. Uh, I hope I'll see you all soon on another episode of the podcast. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you.